Hi, I'm Jonathan Burke, Professor of Finance at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. And I'm Jules van Binsbergen, a finance professor at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. And this is the All Else Equal podcast. Welcome back, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about what I view as probably the most important episode that we've done since we started this podcast series, because we're going to be discussing the importance of freedom of expression and the free exchange of ideas. And we thought that this topic was important, not just because we're seeing a decline of this freedom of expression idea in the academy, but also because we really believe that for corporations, it's important that inside your corporation, you set a culture where people can freely express ideas. Yes, Jules, I can't agree more with you on this. And you know, what I would like to emphasize is we didn't have the idea of doing this podcast topic because we both have a religious view that freedom of expression is something that the country's built on and it's a crucial part of our culture. It's not that at all. We think that without freedom of expression within an organization, the organization is making a mistake. The competitiveness of the organization will suffer and that in the end, the organization will be much worse off without freedom of speech. In other words, freedom of speech is a good business decision. And so the reason why I think it's important that we discuss it now is that in the executive education that I do, where in the last year I've seen hundreds of different executives from various companies, I must say many of them have indicated after me explaining to them that freedom of expression in the academy is quite under pressure, many of them, or maybe all of them even, indicate that they have exactly the same feeling inside their own organizations. So for some reason, this self-censorship, the idea that discussing new ideas and particularly controversial ideas is getting harder, seems to be something that is more and more prevalent, and particularly it's more prevalent in the last five years. So there seems to be some sort of acceleration of this process where the creative discussions are not taking place as much in this, anymore as they used to. Jules, I think one of the important points to understand is that there's no such thing as protecting pleasant speech. People say things like, well, we should have freedom of speech unless it's offensive. People like pleasant speech. There's no reason to protect it. The only speech you have to protect is unpleasant speech. And in an organization, unpleasant speech can take various forms. It can be like somebody pointing out that the way the corporation has been working for a very long time, maybe it worked 20 years ago, but it's no longer working. And since it's become an integral part of the culture, you saying, well, this isn't working anymore, is equivalent to you saying you don't like the organization. And people will react by saying, well, that's unpleasant speech. We don't want to hear it. Well, fine. It's unpleasant speech. But if you don't hear it, the organization doesn't change and it loses its competitive advantage. So this idea that somehow either we only want pleasant speech, that's just a naive view. You actually want to protect the unpleasant speech. No, for sure. And for humans and organizations and just corporations to improve, we need unfeathered critical analysis. And unfortunately, nobody likes to receive criticism. And so criticism will always be experienced by at least some people as offensive speech. So as soon as you say freedom of expression is fine as long as it's not offensive, we immediately need to get into the discussion about who defines what offensive is under what circumstances. And then in many ways, the conversation is already lost. You know, let's think a little bit about what are the motivations of people to censor other people? Why would you even want to shut down criticism? And I think that the answer is, as soon as you start to censor, at least part of the people will start to infer that you're lying. Because why would you have to shut down somebody from making an argument if it was really easy to refute that argument in public debate? If it's easy to refute then there's really no problem. You just refute it. The problem is that most censorship comes to arguments that are not easy to refute. And if the argument's not easy to refute, that bears some thinking. Maybe there is a refute and you can go through it, but maybe it's because the other person has a point. And by taking that point into account, you can become a better organization. For sure. 
if before inside the organization or inside the academy or wherever we had a consensus, a so-called scientific consensus, but it really was a scientific consensus under pressure, and the new argument cannot be refuted, then maybe it's time to really start questioning whether this consensus has any meaning at all. Maybe it's time for us to reevaluate all the arguments, change the corporate strategy, change what the corporation has been doing for the last 20 years and come to the conclusion that this is no longer the right strategy. I mean, you know, Jules, we joke and we say that if Galileo Galilei existed today, we would reject that the earth went round the sun because it would be an heretical argument going against every known scientific theory. And people would say, sorry, you're not allowed to make that argument. And that's what happened, actually. When Galileo Galilei made the argument, Italy was at the forefront of the Renaissance. It was where the Renaissance started. That's where all the thought leaders lived. After Galileo Galilei, all the thought leaders moved to Northern Europe. And that was the end of Italy as a center of, of advancement. So it's a wonderful example of what happens when you shut down freedom of expression. No, and now think about it as this is a corporation. Suppose that you as a corporation become known as the place where people can no longer freely express their new ideas. And there is another corporation, maybe even a different country or a different institutional setting. You're going to start losing talent to that other organization where people are allowed to freely explore their new ideas because that organization is going to be much more successful than your organization. So purely from a competitive advantage point of view, censoring speech seems like an extraordinarily bad idea. You know, I think the best way to make this point is using a specific example. And I can think of no better example than the example described by Michael Lewis in The Big Short, the trade that John Paulson put on to take advantage of the circumstances that led to the 2008 financial crisis. Yeah, so let's set the stage a little bit. There was this desire to increase home ownership in the United States. And for that reason, many mortgages, new mortgages were initiated. At lower standards, people weren't properly checking the income of the people that were getting the mortgages. And more importantly, people were getting these mortgages with what was called teaser rates. And so what does the teaser rate look like? Suppose that the market rate for a mortgage is 4%, but instead of getting the mortgage for 4% in the first year, you're getting a 2.5% interest rate. And so it's 1.5% lower than what the market rate is. And people were taking these mortgages under the assumption that after the teaser period was over, they could simply refinance the mortgage and get a new mortgage at a new teaser rate. So they were getting the mortgage assuming the payment was set at the lower rate, even though they knew that if the payment reset to the higher rate, they wouldn't be able to afford the home and they would default. So now the question is, what assumptions are being made and what can go wrong if people take these mortgages under these conditions? Well, there are two things that could upset the apple cart, as it were. One is, if interest rates went up, then after a year, the people went to refinance, but the new teaser rate wouldn't be 2.5%. It would be some number higher than 2.5%. And at that rate, they couldn't afford the mortgage and they would default. Or the alternative is interest rates didn't go up, but the price of the house went down. So that when it came time to refinance the new mortgage, the bank wouldn't let them take the mortgage because their house would be underwater. So those are the two conditions. If real estate prices went down or interest rates went up, then they wouldn't be able to refinance and they couldn't afford the 4% rate and they would default. But for some reason, nobody was taking into account these two possible downsides. There was a very large amount of groupthink going on, I think for two reasons. The first one was for many decades, no housing defaults, mortgage defaults had been observed. And for at least 40 years, the National House Price Index hadn't been going down. And so everybody was just assuming that this system could keep on working this way. There were even people that made expressions like safe as houses and house prices can never go down. You heard this all over the place. And I think the credit rating agencies for this reason 
when they had to assess what the default risk of these mortgages was, particularly the bonds that were issued with underlying pools of mortgages, what we sometimes call mortgage-backed securities, they gave them all AAA ratings. That is the highest possible rating with the lowest possible credit risk. And when people tried to point out to them the issues, the rating agency's view was that for 70 years, the default rate on mortgages was minute, and mortgages basically didn't default. They never bothered to notice that teaser rates and uh, lax qualification standards were a new thing, that the world where there was very little mortgage default was a world without teaser rates and with strict qualifications to get a mortgage. Yes, it's a, an all else equal mistake. <laughs> and so what did John Paulson, our guest for today, do? What did he decide to do? He observed that there was this groupthink going on, and therefore he decided to bet on the possibility of mortgage default anyway. He shorted the mortgage bonds. Usually when you short a bond, a short a security, you expose yourself. Take GameStop, for example, and say you think GameStop's overvalued. I think most people even now think GameStop's overvalued. The problem with shorting game stock is there's nothing that guarantees that it can't become more overvalued. And when you short a security, if the price goes way up, you have unlimited downside and you can be wiped out. So generally, shorting is a very dangerous thing. The issue, though, in this case was there's a limit to how high the price of the mortgage bond could go. So when John Paulson shorted the mortgages, he didn't have to take that much risk. So John Paulson went to his investors and said, look, this is going to cost us 1% a year. For 1% a year, if there's any drop, if there's any mortgage default, we're going to make a fortune. And what's fascinating about this trade is John Paulson waited until the real estate market started softening. He didn't put the trade on until the real estate market started going down. The reason why that's a strategy that's feasible is that there's this lag between the teaser rates having to be refinanced and the house prices dropping. So you know that once the house prices start dropping in the future, at some point in the future, when the teaser rates have to be refinanced, that's the moment that these mortgages get into trouble. Exactly. And it's absolutely remarkable that nobody noticed this at the point in which real estate prices started softening. What is Truly remarkable is how much money John Paulson made from this trade. He personally made billions of dollars. And remember, he's just the money manager. His investors made much more than he did. And I think this is a, just a wonderful example of what happens when you don't have freedom of expression. Yeah, when people are so caught up in their groupthink that as soon as somebody poses the alternative hypothesis, they're almost laughed out of the room. People are not even willing to entertain the possibility that something that they think cannot be true could possibly be true. And look what the payoff is when it, it, it turns out to be true. Well, that said, this is a good time to introduce our guest, which given the discussion we just had, Jonathan, barely needs any further introduction. I think we're very happy to have John Paulson on the show today. John, welcome to our show. Let me start with what seems like a obvious question, which is, why were you the only one or almost the only one who took advantage of the situation? What did it look like at the time? You know, I've asked myself that question many, many times. And I think that the first reason is people basically project trends. So when a trend has been occurring for a long period of time, it becomes almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. And people don't expect that trend to change. Secondly, they're backward looking and the range of possible outcomes is based on what happened in the past. And further confining that analysis, they limit the period how far they'll look back. So because there was no observable evidence or history of anything like I was expecting to happen that happened, it wasn't in their realm of consideration. And they weren't willing to either look outside of what happened in the recent past or consider that the trend would change. 
Why do you think there wasn't more voices saying, look, these mortgages are being issued in a way that they're much riskier than they appear? Yeah, that's the interesting thing, because I met with Moody's at S&P because I couldn't understand why they were rating many of the securities AAA. And basically, their history went back at the time, maybe 50 years, which would bring you back to 57. They didn't look pre-World War II or, or down to the Great Depression. So in that time period in the U.S., home prices on average increased every year. There wasn't a, an annual period in which home prices declined on a national scale. So they said that's a long period of time. They've never gone down. And we won't put in our model the prospect that they could go down. There were pockets of the country where home prices went down, one period in California and one period in the Gulf Coast when oil prices collapsed. But those were regional occurrences, not national occurrences. And their models were based on national trends, and they were sufficiently diversified across regions to get rid of any regional risk, according to their analysis. So they just were not willing to consider. And in that period, also, the most recent period, home prices were escalating double digit for the last five years. So they had a 50-year record that never went down. The last five years, they were double digit. To put in a data point in their model that home prices would go down, they thought was pure speculation. And what they told me was Moody's doesn't speculate. And they referred to me in that case as a speculator. And so why was nobody saying, but what if? Even if it's a slow probability event, what if? Yeah, it's amazing. There had never been a default of an investment-grade mortgage security. So, you know, they had all this evidence. Home prices go down. Investment-grade never defaulted. Recent period was up. But you're right in one sense that there would never been mortgage underwritten of such low quality. The credit quality had never been as poor as it was in that period. So why would they look at a past period to project how these mortgages will perform in the future? And you're right. They didn't believe the what-if scenario existed. It was not in the realm of their consideration. So, John, somehow you managed to create inside your organization a culture where people did feel comfortable speaking up and considering this what if scenario. So what did you do and how did you make that environment in such a way that people felt comfortable doing that? Because clearly you were an outlier. Many other organizations could have done the same thing, but ended up not doing that. Yeah, that's a good point. I was not convinced that highest prices only went up. I lived in New York my whole life. I remember in 76, 77, following the recession, they were giving away home prices. They were giving away houses, beautiful apartments on Fifth Avenue. You could basically buy for nothing because the maintenance fees were so high, but they went for like 100,000 full floor apartments. So years later, there were several million and they probably peaked at 30 million. And then in Southampton, I was bidding on a house for 800,000. We went into the recession in 90 after Drexel fell. This house went into default, and ultimately I bought the house in a bankruptcy auction. The owner defaulted on the mortgage for 235000 So I saw a lot of people buy real estate at the bottom, a lot of foreclosures. And then when the market came back, they made very high returns. So I thought real estate was cyclical, that it didn't only go up, but people were caught up in the euphoria. And it's not too different than the euphoria that existed in the uh, bond market last year or the European bonds, how could someone buy bonds with negative interest rates? The Swiss, you're paying a point and a half to two points negative interest to hold a Swiss bond. It was like preposterous. Same with German bonds, it negative yields. How could possibly someone buy a bond? And it seems so preposterous today, but yet they were doing it. Record amounts of uh, securities trading with negative yields. You know, there's something that happens in the bubble mentality where people um, just become blindsided and don't consider um, the what-if scenario or any other alternatives. What do you think you could do about this group thing when people do this? 
Because obviously, if you are able not to get caught up in the group think, there are huge profit opportunities. You're right. We just recently saw that in the um, stock market and the bond market. The problem with profiting from it, Jonathan, is getting the timing right. Because if you're on the short side and you get the timing wrong, you can get wiped out if there's no cap. Many people lost billions on Tesla. I remember people were coming to me, Tesla's overvalued. It's worth more than Mercedes. And I said, how could that be? Mercedes, such a great car company globally, the best. How could Tesla be worth more than Mercedes? And then Tesla was worth more than BMW, Mercedes, and Volkswagen, which includes Audi and Bentley and Porsche. And then Tesla was worth more than the entire German auto industry. That didn't make, and then it was worth more than Renault and all the British manufacturers, Italians, was worth more than the entire European car industry. And then ultimately worth more than the US and European car industry. And then ultimately was worth more than the entire public market value of all the auto companies in the world. So it was preposterous, yet it kept going up. So if you ever shorted, you would have been killed. So you got to be able to get the timing right, depending on the structure of the investment, and then be able to cap the downside if the euphoria continues beyond your expected uh, time frame. You know, as a society, we shut down people who have different views because you make these people feel as if they're stupid or they're idiotic for expressing an alternative view. In your organization, how do you encourage people to talk up and go against the grain? I think to some extent, Jonathan, we're all guilty of groupthink or cognitive dissonance, but it is isn't important to have an open environment, to have meetings, broad meetings, and ask people for their opinions and encourage them to speak out even when the viewpoint is different than the consensus or your own and not embarrass them or make fun of them or insult them because they have a different viewpoint. It's so important to drill down the logic of their viewpoint and see if it makes sense or they're adding something valuable, but you definitely want to encourage not casting people for expressing uh, different viewpoints. Do you think it's possible to set up explicit incentives for this? Or have you ever thought about setting up explicit incentives for this? That if somebody deviates from the group and they turn out to be right, that somehow you reward them more? If not incentives, at least whoever is running the meeting to encourage different viewpoints and protect people that have different viewpoints and provide the institutional support that that person will not be drowned out. As you said, Jonathan, this is, extends beyond business. We got into many discussions at the uh, secondary school my daughters went to, which became really intolerant of any viewpoint that was not aligned with their woke and far left viewpoints. And if you expressed a different viewpoint, you were in danger of being called a racist or expelled or penalized. And there was no institutional support in this environment to allow deferred viewpoints to be spread since the administration was aligned with that viewpoint and they were not really looking for discussion. They were looking for implementation and their goal was not to encourage discussion, but to silence any opposition so they could implement their agenda as quickly as they could. The other area at Stafford I worry most about is there's a minority that agrees with that viewpoint and they have very strongly about the viewpoint and that would be fine. But where I think it really gets bad is socially people are ostracized if they don't have that viewpoint. And obviously students, a large part of their two-year experience at the GSB at Stanford is the social experience and they live in fear of being ostracized in that environment. And as a result, it shuts down enormous amount of discussion because they're so worried. You're absolutely right. And I mean, I do what I can, but obviously it's, it's limited. But what I try to get across is this idea that it's get into the habit of looking at somebody who disagrees with you and assuming bad intent from them is really bad because 
in a business environment and you keep doing that, you're going to miss opportunities. Yeah, it has to come from the top. If you don't have a support for freedom of discussion or support for open discussion, then the person who has the opposing view will not be protected for expressing it and risks expulsion or retaliation for expressing different views unless the institution itself protects that freedom. And we all know plenty of professors, students, people that have lost their jobs for expressing uh, different opinions. Thank you very much, John, for being on the show. That was very interesting. It was great to have you, John. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jonathan Jules, and thank you for covering this important topic. Thanks for listening to the All Else Equal podcast. Please leave us a review at Apple Podcasts. We love to hear from our listeners. And be sure to catch our next episode by subscribing or following our show wherever you listen to your podcasts. For more information and episodes, visit allelseequalpodcast.com or follow us on LinkedIn. The All Else Equal podcast is a production of Stanford University's Graduate School of Business and is produced by Alumni FM.